July of AD 64, the Romans believed their emperor Nero had set the city of Rome on fire, mostly because his insatiable need to build. He just loved to build, and he needed to tax people in order to build. And when it kind of got to where they really couldn't get more and more places to build, he decided to burn the city down and build better. Well, this was really hard on the people there. They, their homes were destroyed, their livelihoods, they were quite distraught and upset, partly also because a lot of the things that burned were their, their, their temples and their sculptures and their statues and their deities, and they just thought that you know, their, their, their gods were powerless against this, and they were really angry, and they turned on Nero. And he realized he couldn't have that, so he found the perfect scapegoat to blame for this, Christians. And that was perfect because he associated these new Jesus followers and the new churches that were growing with the Jews who the Romans hated the Jews. So that's why it was the perfect scapegoat. And Peter was the church leader at the time during that. And Peter wrote First Peter. He wrote two books. Peter was also thrown in prison at least twice. And the first book he wrote is um, about suffering as a Christian. So First Peter is kind of troubles and hardships from the outside. And then Second Peter, which he did write from prison right before he was executed, um, he wrote about problems in the church. So problems from the inside. And false leaders and immoral leaders and things in the church. But right in the first part of this second book, the first chapter, Peter is really concerned and really wanted to teach us all how to grow as a Christian. How to grow as a Christian. Now, by the way, Simon was the name that his parents gave him. Peter was the name that Jesus gave him. It means little stone or little rock, and it means, and Jesus kind of gave him that to help him remember that he needs to remain solid. Sometimes he wasn't, <laughs> like when Jesus was, 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 on, was arrested. He kind of wasn't as solid. But Jesus gave him that name to remind him to be a solid guy, solid Christian. Um, some of you also know that some places in Scripture he's called Cephas. Cephas is just the Aramaic term for Peter. So Simon, Peter, Cephas, same guy, just so you know, okay? So Peter focuses in the passage that we're going to talk about for the next three weeks on spiritual growth, a commitment to spiritual growth and confidence, and that's why it's exciting because we all need it because we have troubles that we deal with. We have troubles outside and sometimes troubles inside too. And as we grow as a Christian, those troubles get not necessarily less or less, but they give us more strength and confidence to get through them. Okay. So let's turn to Second Peter and I'll just read. So follow along with your Bible. Hopefully you brought a Bible or there's one in front of you probably have one on your phone. Let's follow along. It's good to have your eyes on God's word because God wrote this through Peter to us, to all of us here. Okay. Second Peter chapter one. Simon Peter, a bond servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of God and Savior Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. But also, for this very reason, giving all diligence, 
add to your faith virtue, to virtue, knowledge, to knowledge, self-control, to self-control, perseverance, to perseverance, godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness, and a brotherly kindness, love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will neither be barren or useless nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. My wife and I, like to, we, we like to ride mountain bikes. And it's partly why we're here, because the trails are really good here. We've been riding for over 35 years or so, and we've ridden in at least 20 states. And around here, when the trail, when it's real dry, which it has been for several years, the soil around here can get real dusty, and it's not very good traction. I mean, it's rideable, but you've got to be real careful, and it's somewhat scary sometimes. On the other hand, when it does rain, the trails get so muddy that the mud sticks to your tires, and it's like riding on grease, and that's not fun. And that can be dangerous. But right in between, if there's just a little bit of moisture in this dirt around here, it is great to ride because the traction is amazing. It's just enough so that the, the tread on your tires kind of digs in and gives you great traction. The mountain bikers call that hero dirt. Because when you ride in that, it makes you feel like a hero. And it gives you confidence and strength and power, and you just, you really enjoy it. You really enjoy the riding. And one of the times when recently when we were riding in hero dirt, I was just thinking of that term, hero. And as you're riding, you know, your mind's going. But I was thinking, who are heroes in my life? Who are heroes in your life? Some, like actors, we like to watch movies that have heroes, but there are real heroes in life. And then, are you a hero to somebody? Are you a hero to your kids or maybe your grandkids? Maybe to your spouse or neighbors? What makes a hero, I got to thinking. And then I got to thinking, you know, Jesus is my number one hero and a whole lot more. What makes him a hero to me? And we're to be like Jesus. We're to take on his characteristics the more and more that we grow as a Christian so that we can be a hero like him. And would Jesus call me a hero now? And if not, what would it take for me to be called a hero to Jesus? So in these first verses here that we read, one came to my mind, and it was this last one that we read. Verse 11, for so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I want to remember that verse because I'm going to come back to that in a little bit. But before we get started, I want to make sure you understand that you do not need to do anything to earn your salvation other than realize you're a sinner and repent to Jesus of your sins and accept him and what he did on the cross as the penalty that you normally would have paid for those sins on your behalf. And he thought so highly of you that he did that for you. So you already are a hero to him. We just want to go through this series because he thought so highly of you that he died for you. We want to be a hero to him as a thank you for what he did for us. We don't have to, but we want to. So this whole series is really about spiritual growth and confidence during increasingly tough times in this world. 
Maybe similar to when Peter was writing this. The more you grow, the more useful to him you can be, and the more you can enhance Jesus' kingdom and be his representative here, and the more you can glorify him as a thank you for what he did on the cross for you. So we want to grow. We want to be more useful for him. So let's look at ourselves, really. Most of us don't feel like heroes, and especially not to Jesus. Most of us feel like we're an out-of-shape Christian. (laughs) And when we get to heaven, we're not sure what we're going to be greeted by Jesus like. Um, Maybe we're wounded by life's hardships and frustrations and maybe even our inadequacies as a Christian. We are going to get to heaven, but what will it be like when we get there? Few people will burst into heaven victorious. But yet that's what this passage really says in 11. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Burst into heaven victorious into the loving arms of Jesus where he says, well done, good and faithful servant. You can burst into heaven victorious. And you have already showed up for the first lesson of how to do that. (laughs) So what does Jesus say about being a hero? He frequently uses a similar word, overcome. Because basically that's what heroes do. They overcome hardships, they overcome difficulties, and rise above those. So Jesus has three main passages, so you can turn to these if you like. And we'll see what he says about about a hero. First one, here is John 16, 33. Where he says, these things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation or troubles. Be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Jesus is saying he is a hero. Then in Revelation 2 and 3, Jesus uses the word overcomes seven different times. That's where the letters are to the churches that Jesus wrote. And he uses the word overcome those seven times. And each time that he uses that, the person that he says overcomes gets a reward. And we won't turn there and read those. But there's one really similar about that and about the rewards, and that's Revelation 21, 7. So right at the end of our Bible, like one of the last things that God tells us, this is really cool. This is my favorite one, Revelation 21, 7, where God says, he who overcomes, or is a hero, shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Now sit back and think about that for a minute. We'll inherit all things. There'll be a reward for being a hero. A hero is who overcomes. And the reward here is actually really amazing. Let me explain it this way. Picture yourself as an orphan. You've been an orphan and it's looking pretty bleak for you. But when you become a teenager, you get adopted by a loving and very wealthy man. I mean, this guy owns vast amounts of land and estates. He owns shopping malls. He owns amusement parks. He owns golf courses. He owns mountain bike trails. (laughs) This guy owns all this stuff. And he puts his arm around you and says, this is your inheritance, all of this is yours. That's what God says when we get to heaven. He who overcomes shall inherit all things. I don't know about you, but I can't wait to see what that is. You know, the apostle John, who sat under Jesus, heard him use this term a lot. 
In fact, all three of these passages here, actually even the letters to the churches, John wrote. And the last one is really cool too. And he loved that word overcome, or hero. <laughs> First John 5, 4 through 6. For whoever is born of God overcomes the world. He's talking about godly things. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is he who overcomes the world? But he who believes in Jesus is the Son of God. This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Heroes are only heroes if they prevail over an adversary or overcome difficulties or threats or a dire situation. They hold their principles and their training high and hold them dear and use them to overcome things and situations. Heroes are admired for their courage. They're rising above these circumstances and their noble qualities and their achievements for others. Heroes are known for their achievements for others. Sometimes it's self-sacrifice. They may be battle-worn, they may have scars, but they are still victorious. That's a hero. Dear friends, you have come to the service and see this online, you've come to a crossroads where you have in front of you two roads to follow. Which of these guys up here are you going to be? You have made, you have to make a choice now. Am I going to limp into heaven wounded, frustrated, maybe even upset at God? How could you do these things? Or burst in victorious, straight into the arms of Jesus. So if you're ready to be a hero and burst into heaven victorious, you can. You have tools. And we're going to talk about certain things here, certain steps, certain tools that you have over the next few weeks to help you be a hero. God has outfitted you with hero tools. Okay? He's also given you help by the people around you. It's called a church. It's called a pastor, teachers, elders, these Bible study teachers, given you those kinds of things to help you grow also. And here's another one. Those are all help from the outside. You also have help from the inside. The Holy Spirit in you has promised to help. In fact, Jesus called the Holy Spirit the helper. Right before he left to heaven, I'm going to send a helper to help you, he said. The Holy Spirit is a helper. More on those as we progress, okay? So the steps, all of these steps are in our passage. Today we're going to cover the first one, and then the next two Sundays we're going to cover the other four. But this is how Peter laid this out. The Holy Spirit through Peter laid out these steps of how to be a hero and how to burst into heaven victorious. And we all have to have a goal, and that goal is to burst into heaven victorious where Jesus says to you, well done, good and faithful servant, gives you a hug and says, enter <laughs> into the joy. And remember, it's all tied into spiritual growth. It's all, into, it's all because of spiritual growth and biblical and experiential knowledge centered on Jesus Christ. God, through Peter, laid this out, and it is so cool to see when you see it this way. And it's actually, these are steps that you can work on. Like when I went to college and I had all of my textbooks, at the end of the year, you get to sell your textbooks back to get your money back, and I sold most of them back. But I kept two or three that I knew I was going to use. I was going to use in my career, so I kept those textbooks, and I still have those. It's like this. We got the textbook of how to learn and how to apply it to our life. 
So this first one is called your mindset, okay? What your mind is set on. And this is in the first four verses here. We'll look at it a verse at a time, or sometimes even a word at a time. We will learn about thinking more vertically than horizontally. That's our mindset. More vertically. Vertically, prayer, thinking of God, reading God's word, thinking vertically. Not so much horizontally. Yeah, we have to live in the horizontal world, but we don't let these horizontal things affect us or change our demeanor. That's what the vertical does. We want to live more vertically than horizontally. Horizontal is worldly things. Vertical is godly things. That's our mindset. He starts by calling himself a bondservant of Jesus Christ. See that right away. Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ. And I want you to be a bondservant too. That's part of the training this first day of class. You have to realize that you need to be a bondservant. And what does that mean? (laughs) A bondservant is a willing slave, a slave that is willingly serving his master. This actually comes from the Old Testament. This comes from Exodus 21, if you want to read about it. What there was due was, back then, servants or slaves or those who were, had to work off a debt or something, worked for six years and then were set free. Six years was your term to serve. But after those six years, if you wanted to stay serving that master because the conditions were good, he was an awesome boss, or whatever reason, you could choose to stay with that master forever. And you would be then called a bond servant. And they would do the ceremony. And again, you can read about this in Exodus 21. The ceremony is if you chose to serve that master forever, they would take you to the doorpost of the house and put you up against a doorpost, doorpost back here, and they would use an awl or a nail and pierce your ear to the doorpost. Just a little ceremony. Of course, they'd pull it out real quick, and you would put an earring in that ear. And that would show everybody that through the ceremony, you are bonded to that household, bonded to that servant for the rest of your life. And that earring would show others that you chose to work for this guy for the rest of your life. It also was kind of a badge of honor for the the servant, but also for the master. Because the master's like, look, I'm such a good master That guy chose to stay with me forever. I am really good. That's the mentality, that's the mindset that Peter wants us to have and be. Chosen to serve Jesus Christ as our master forever. And that's a badge of honor for him and for us. I don't know about the earring thing, but once in a while, if I see a Christian guy with an earring, I think, I wonder if he knows that that is really cool. And why? (laughs) So being devoted to Jesus is a great mindset. He insinuates that by what he says next. To those, you all, who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So to all of you reading this letter, this applies to you. And to those who have been given salvation through God's plan carried out by Jesus Christ. The way this is written says that salvation is only through Jesus Christ. And the righteousness of God is an equal gift and that righteousness is imputed to the believer through faith. Like precious, see that there? Like precious faith means equal rank, honor, or position based on faith and Jesus. In other words, equal, your salvation is equal to that of Peter and the other apostles. There's no first or second class Christians, nor spiritual, social, racial, or gender distinctions. 
Galatians 3.28 confirms that, which says, There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. That's what it means when it says, To those, you, who have obtained like precious faith. You're as equal par as Peter, James, and John. (laughs) Equal par with John MacArthur. Equal par with Franklin Graham, Billy Graham. Equal par. That's cool. And is that important? Yes, that's important. Look at verse 2. It says, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Grace and peace. Grace was a Greek salutation, and peace is a Jewish salutation. So it's another way of him saying to everyone. And peace, the Jewish word for peace is shalom. You see, they say shalom a lot. Shalom, Shalem. Jerusalem is called the city of peace. Jeru means city of. Shalom, peace. Both of these, grace and peace, insinuates to everyone, but there's much more to these two words than just a salutation. A hero must realize that grace and peace is at your disposal. God's grace and peace are best experienced and even multiplied through a true knowledge of God and of Jesus. Let me read 2 and 3 again so we can see that in here. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. And his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. Through God's power and Jesus' work, it's why we have been saved. See that in verse 3? Who were called us. It's why we've been saved. And also, two thoughts come to mind here. God's divine power has preserved the Bible. God's word for us to learn from. Through the knowledge of him. God's word has preserved the Bible. Yeah, there are different translations, but the underlying everything, God is powerful enough to have kept it pure till here. And as they find more fragments and Dead Sea Scrolls and things, it just proves the Bible we have is still what God wrote. And it's because the Old Testament says God's word is more important to him than even his name. It's important to God. And it says in the New Testament that his word will live forever. God is powerful. He is powerful enough to make sure that his word that is so important to him is true. And we have versions that are more literal. We can see what it really says. Some that are more easier reading, but the truth is still there, and it's not been diluted. So if somebody says, oh yeah, we can't really trust the Bible anymore, it's not the way it was originally written, have a very puny view of God and his power, and what's important to him. God is powerful, and that's what it says here, to keep his word. Another thing I think of is, grace and peace come to us the more we learn about God and what he has done for us through salvation and especially learning about Jesus from the Bible and how he acted and how he dealt with people and the situations and the problems and the hardships and even the difficult cultural and political times around him. You know, the government at the time was the Roman government and they were very oppressive to the Jewish people. And just like today, grace and peace are both highly sought-after items in that environment. And they are foundational to your spiritual growth. Once you are saved, God doesn't want you to stay a baby Christian. 
He wants you to grow and mature and become discerning and to become helpful to others and to teach other things and to grow and glorify him and be useful to him and enhance his kingdom and to burst into heaven victorious and have Jesus say, well done. Well, you have to do things for him to say, well done. Good and faithful servant. You have to be faithful to Jesus and his word. And if he calls you servant, it means you have to serve. You have to do things here. So what is grace? <clears throat> We're talking about grace and peace. Let's talk about those two real quick. Grace, well, let me use this. I like an acronym. <clears throat> grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. God's riches at Christ's expense. That's what, that, that kind of tells what grace is. Something freely given. Remember that story of the orphan? And that guy freely gave to that new child of his grace. Someone else paid for it. They get it. That's what grace is. Because of what Jesus did on the cross, we can see grace through his forgiveness. We can see his grace that everything is going to be okay. Even though you're not perfect, that's all right. That's grace. <laughs> Even though you try and you stumble and you get back up and apologize to God, that's grace. God sees Jesus when he looks at you because of what he did on the cross on your behalf. He doesn't see your past faults and sins. Jesus took them all away. So God only sees the righteousness of Jesus in you. That's grace. God sees his child and the inheritance you get. And that's something really cool. And it gives us a peace. A peace of mind, right? A peace of mind. The more you grow and mature as a Christian, the more you realize God's grace and God's peace. Here's what peace is. Peace is that calm <clears throat> that calm knowledge and feeling of assurance that all is going to be okay because God our Father is in control. Because God our Father is in control. <clears throat> and that it's all okay right now, although it may not seem like it to us at the time, it will be okay. It will even get better to the point where we get to hug Jesus and spend eternity with him. There's a peace in that. These come to us through God and Jesus by his power and multiplies as you grow as a Christian. And those are multiplied by your knowledge and understanding of him and studying his word. Okay, The more you study and read God's word and grow as a Christian, the more grace you get and see, the more peace you get and have. Here's another way of saying that. <clears throat> the closer you are to God, the less chaotic life is. Grace and peace. The closer you get to God, the less chaotic life is. Is life chaotic right now? Maybe you need to get closer to God. <laughs> and one other thing about grace and peace. These two items are missing from the world today and are highly sought after by people in the world today. And we Christians have both. Do they see both of those in you at work or at the store? When people see that in you and see that you have those, they may ask you about them. And when they do, as Peter wrote in 1 Peter 3, 5, have a ready answer when they come to you and ask you about that. It's because of Jesus and the knowledge of him. And then you get to share the gospel to them because they came to you and asked you. <laughs> so it's kind of like a witness, having grace and peace. But grace and peace isn't all you get. Let's look at verse 3. <clears throat> 
by God's power, and he has a lot of power, you receive gifts, not a few gifts, not a lot of gifts, but all things pertaining to life and godliness. This is incredible. The most mature Christians here are nodding. Yeah, I've seen that happen in my life. These incredible gifts of things that pertain to life and godliness through God's word. The young Christians haven't seen that yet, but that's because the gifts are still, they're wrapped and they haven't opened them up yet. (laughs) But you will get them. That pertain to life and godliness. That word life, by the way, is a triple entendre. Triple entendre means three different meanings, but they both apply. Okay? So let's look at that. First one. Jesus said in John 10.10 that I have come so that you may have life and have it more abundantly to the full. So the first meaning of the word life here, right? His divine power have given to us all things that pertain to life. The first one is an abundant life to the full. The more mature as a Christian you get, the more abundant and full your life is in a good way. Secondly, 1 Corinthians 2, 9 through 10. Let's turn there, if you will, because this is really cool. And some people take this a little bit different than what it says, what it actually says, but let's turn there. 1 Corinthians 2, 9 through 10. <clears throat> First part says this, but it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. That verse in its context of this passage here means wisdom and truth from the word of God enhances your life. It enhances your life. And it says that here that way because of verse 10, which says that God reveals those to you through his word by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit illuminates scripture for you, helps you understand scripture when you read it. If you're reading a passage and you don't understand it, ask that God will explain it to you. He may then, or it may be sometime, sometimes put a date. I question what this means and put a date. There will come a time when you'll be reading that again and be like, oh, I know what it means now. (laughs) The Holy Spirit helps you to understand that. So your life is enhanced by Scripture. That's another meaning of that. And the third meaning is, life means eternal and secure in heaven. Eternal life. A secure life by salvation from Jesus and spending eternity with him. The more you know about Jesus and his power, the more you will feel securely saved. No one nor no event can ever take that away from you. What Jesus did on the cross for you is secure. That's why Jesus said, it is finished. To Tetelestai was his last word, which is Greek for paid in full. It's done. You are secure. You're in God's hands for eternity with him. Back to verse 3. It says, all thing, back to verse 3 in Second Peter, chapter 1. <clears throat> it says, in all things that pertain to life and godliness... To be godly is to live reverently, loyally, and obediently toward God. To be holy as God is holy, which means different than worldly. We're to be a little bit different than the world, right? God has given you spiritual provisions to live a life here on earth that glorifies him. What's cool is your ability is sustained by God's power. He gives you the power to glorify him and to live differently than non-Christians. To say that more practically, to withstand the world's anti-Christian influences and temptations. And to stand firm for what is godly. 
and to know how to recognize the differences there, to recognize the two. To withstand the world's anti-Christian influences and temptations and to stand firm for what is godly and to know how to recognize the two. You are to endeavor to be like Jesus. Jesus is God, so having Christ-likeness is godliness. And that is a mindset of a hero. Why? Because God, with glory and virtue, chose you for purposes before you were born. You see that in verse 3? To the knowledge of him who called us. Godliness is a noble calling. Let me read 2 Timothy 1, 8 through 9. That explains that a little bit better. 2 Timothy 1, 8 through 9. Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus Before time began, your purpose, the job you're supposed to do as a servant of Christ, God had figured out before time began, before you were even born. Your calling is unique. God planned it for you way back then. Heroes know what that calling is and adhere to it. They don't back down. They don't let God down. All things that pertain to life and godliness come more and more the more knowledge of him you have. And by the way, Peter uses the word knowledge in this second Peter 16 times must be important. He uses that word knowledge three or four times in this passage we read this morning that we're studying here alone, three or four times alone. Knowledge of God our Father in verse 1, 2. Knowledge of Jesus in verse 1, 2, B, the second part there. And in verse 8. And in verse 3 it says knowledge of him who called us. So this word knowledge must be important, right? Right? Must be important. Now, he says, knowledge of God our Father, knowledge of Jesus. And I had a hunch that Peter's emphasis, or the Holy Spirit's emphasis, on this word knowledge, being tied to God, would include the three persons of the one God, the Trinity. Okay, so we already saw God, the knowledge of God our Father, that's Father, knowledge of Jesus the Son. So we got to looking at this knowledge of him who called us, and I was right. The Holy Spirit is insinuated there. See, the Greek phrase in verse 3, which takes our English language, several words to say, knowledge of him who called us, is only one word in the Greek. Knowledge of him who called us is one word, and it's the word kaleo. And it means called forth or an inner calling. Knowledge of God's calling for you. I just talked about that a little bit ago, and some of you are probably going, okay, how do I know what that calling is? (laughs) I think I need to know. One of the ways is to realize the Holy Spirit in you puts in you a desire to do things for Christ, to do something for Christ. That desire is a calling. And to glorify Jesus and be his representative here on earth, to enhance Jesus' kingdom in some way, is to do that calling. What's that desire in you that points to Jesus, that points to serving him in some way? What is that desire? You can point to Jesus either by talking about Jesus to friends, neighbors, co-workers, customers, vendors, or by being so much like Jesus that they see Jesus in and through you. 
and ask you why you're different in a good way. So you can either tell people about Jesus or act like Jesus. And that is at least the start of your calling. And then you can take it further from there. But before we get off on that trail, let's go back to this word knowledge. Peter uses the word, the Greek word here, epignosis. Epignosis. This is a much bigger, more encompassing word of knowledge than, than just gnosis, which is knowledge in other places in Scripture. Epic knowledge, epignosis. You know what epic means, right? That, you know, when you see a, an epic movie, it's like four hours long and it covers all. The, you go on an epic vacation, it's multi city, multi country tour, vast, all encompassing. Maybe an, an epic cruise is all encompassing, all inclusive, okay? So, what does that really mean for us here? All inclusive knowledge means head knowledge, it means heart knowledge, and it means application knowledge. That word knowledge isn't just head knowledge, but a relationship knowledge. Intimately know Jesus, and He know you. In your head, in your heart, and that is evidenced by how you act and what people see in you. You know, one of the scariest verses in the Bible, we won't get into this too much, but Matthew 7, 21 through 23, where all these religious people are evidently being cast to eternal hell, and they're like, but, but Lord, Lord, we did all these things in your name. We did all this stuff. Why are we being cast out? And Jesus said, away from me. I didn't know you. They had head knowledge. They called him Lord. But they didn't have the heart knowledge, and they didn't have all three of those, the epignosis. We need to make sure that our mindset includes all epignosis of Jesus and God's word, head, heart, and our actions. On to verse 4. Exceedingly great and precious promises. There's that word again, exceedingly. Similarly is the word multiplied. And another similar word is the word abundant. More and more as you grow and mature as a Christian. What are great and precious promises? Well, there's quite a few. And the more you grow, the more you learn what they are. But abundant life is one. Eternal life is another. Secure life in Christ. Romans 8, 28, there's a promise that God will cause all things to work together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose for you, those two caveats. But there's a promise, God will cause all things to work together for, for good. When people see you, do they see Jesus? Do they see Jesus' nature, his character traits? Are you compassionate, loving, kind, trustworthy? Forgiving, joyous, do you have peace about you? Or do you let things rattle you, you hear in the news? <laughs> Are you just? Are you under self-control? You will have help by the Holy Spirit because those are all listed in Galatians 5 as the fruits of the Spirit, by the way. The fruits of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit helps you. Let's... Look at this last one, and then we'll be done. Escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. The final portion of this verse for today. Escaped means successful flight from or delivered from. And corruption here means something that is crumbling or decaying, decaying around you. The world is crumbling around us or decaying. It's doing so because of the sinfulness and the lusts which lust means self-centeredness, wanting what God says is bad for you. Maybe what once was important to you but isn't anymore now that you're a growing Christian. A growing Christian distances himself from worldly lusts and has a growing hatred for sin and sinful things. Doesn't even want them anymore. You have escaped them. 
Thanks to Jesus, a growing Christian has escaped that worldly corruption and the penalties resulting from indulging in those lusts. Those worldly corrupt guilts and resultant penalties have been forgiven by Jesus for you, washed away, wiped clean off your sight, off your slate. That's cool. In some Baptist churches, I would get an amen right then. (laughs) Amen. Jesus gets the amen. We are rich with what matters most, and thanks to what Jesus did on the cross, you and the more biblical knowledge you have, the more richer you get, and the more of a solid, unwavering Christian you are, and it starts with these things here in your mindset. Set your minds on things above, not on things of the world. In your bulletin is some action steps on the back. I'd like you to take those home and work on those. There's even words of a little song. And I put these words there because when times were tough in my job and career, there were times when I was driving to a meeting that I know wasn't going to go well, I would sing those words. And I want you to have something like that because it is so helpful to turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of this world will grow strangely dim in the light of his grace and love and power. And the more knowledge of him you have. Dear Jesus, thank you for your example for us. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for writing through Peter these words that help us. And thank you, Father. I know you're all one, but I'm saying thank you to you all to make sure that we all know and how thankful we are that you do want us to grow and tell us how. And may we learn and grow here in the next few weeks to be a Christian that will burst into heaven and right into your arms, Jesus, grinning from ear to ear hug you and you say well done good and faithful servant in your name Jesus I pray amen